So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to attend our this week Rogers in Fusion AI seminar. And today we're very honored to have a Professor Mi Zhang from the Michigan State University to give this AutoML talk from Neural Architecture Search to Data Center AutoML. And uh, Professor Zhang is currently an associate professor and the director of the Machine Learning System Lab, Michigan State University. And uh, he received his PhD degree in the computer engineer from the University of Southern California and a bachelor degree in the in electrical engineering from the Peking University. And then before that, he was a postdoc scholar at uh, Cornell University. And his research lies at the intersection of the embedded system and the machine intelligence spanning areas, including on-device edge AI for mobile, wearable IoT embedded sensor system, tiny ML automated machine learning, system for machine learning, machine learning for systems, federal learning and human-centered AI for health and the social good. Dr. Zhang has received a number of awards from his research. He is the, the first place winner uh, in US and Canada of the 2019 Google MicroNet Challenge, the third place winner of the 2017 NSF Hairballs Challenges and uh, many other uh, champions of the, the in the challenge. He is also the recipient of the seven best paper awards and the nominations. He's also the recipient of the, the NSF CI award, Facebook research, uh, faculty research award, Amazon machine learning research award, MSU innovation of the year award. And the, many of his works have been reported by NSF, NH, IEEE, ACM, and the media such as the Time, MIT Technology Review, and so on for more than 100 times. And now let's welcome Professor Zhang to give us this talk. Um, thanks so much for the very nice uh, introduction and uh, thanks so much for inviting me to be here today. Um, so my, my talk today is um, titled um, From Neural Architecture Search uh, to Data-Centric uh, RML. Um, okay, so yeah, um, so in recent years, um, Automated machine learning, or AutoML in short, has attracted significant attention uh, due to its capability of uh, automating the design of important components of machine learning systems. So in this talk, uh, I wanted to um, talk about our recent works uh, in, in this particular area. Uh, and this talk uh, consists of two parts, where the first part uh, focuses on a neuroactive search, and the second part um, focuses on um, data-centric automated machine learning. So let's get started uh, with uh, the first part. So, um, so neuroactive search or NAS in short um, is a very important technique uh, of uh, AutoML uh, where the goal of uh, NAS is to automatically design high quality neural architecture, um, uh, neural, neural network architectures. So in the past few years, um, if you look at the literature, the architectures um, found by NAS are able to achieve superior performance than the manual design ones already. Um, so here is um, um, a brief overview of the NAS pipeline. Um, um, a standard NAS pipeline uh, consists of uh, three key components, a search space, a search algorithm, and a performance estimation strategy. So the search space um, contains all the possible neural architecture candidates to be searched. Uh, in particular, uh, it defines a set of operations such as uh, identity, convolution, and the pooling, and, um, and how these operations can be connected to form valid neural architectures. So the search algorithm first samples a uh, network architecture candidate from the search space, uh, the performance evaluation strategy then um, evaluates the performance of the actor candidate. The, the performance can be, um, you know, in general, uh, the accuracy of the model or the flops uh, of, the, of the model or any uh, hardware related uh, uh, metrics such as latency, uh, memory, and power consumption. So the performance of this architecture candidates is then um, returned uh, to the search algorithm as a feedback um, so that uh, the search algorithm can sample the next architecture candidate from, this, from the search space in the next iteration. Um, so, you know, although, um, you know, neural search has uh, achieved a significant performance 
um, the search space uh, usually contains hundreds of or thousands or even millions of neural architectures. Therefore, um, the key bottleneck of uh, neural architecture search is its uh, extremely high search cost. Um, to address this bottleneck, um, existing works uh, either um, focus on search space design and partitioning, developing uh, an ineffective search algorithm, such as uh, you know, evolution-based or reinforcement learning-based or even um, Bayesian information, uh, Bayesian optimization-based uh, search algorithms, or designing you know, efficient performance estimation strategies, such as with sharing to speed up the overall mass process. Um, so in this talk, I, I wanted to um, um, tackle this problem from a totally different perspective. In particular, I wanted to um, shed light on the importance of active encoding um, on the subroutines in the NAS pipeline, as well as the overall performance of, of uh, neural active search. So in particular, um, I will talk about the two works, uh, um, you know, uh, on active encoding. Um, the first work, um, which we uh, refer to as uh, ARC2WAC, uh, proposed a unsupervised learning-based architecture encoding method um, that uh, decouples the architecture representation learning and architecture search into two separate processes. The second work, uh, which is referred to as Kate, um, proposes a, um, um, a method to encode computations other than structures of the neural architectures, um, you know, we are a transformer-based encoder. So both of these work, um, you know, aim to uh, tackle um, the, you know, the, the challenge of high search cost uh, from the encoding perspective, which is kind of different or very different from the existing work. So the majority of the, you know, if you look at the literature, um, the majority of the NAS methods um, encodes uh, the neural architectures in the search space using adjacency matrix based encoding. In particular, uh, they use the operation matrix uh, to encode the uh, operations, and they use this adjacency matrix uh, to encode the connection between these, uh, these operations. Unfortunately, um, the size of this uh, adjacency matrix uh, grows quadratically at the search space scales up, uh, making the downstream architecture search much less efficient. So to address this um, key um, drawback of um, adjacency matrix based encoding, um, learning-based encoding methods with different type of architecture encoders, uh, such as LSTM, uh, MLP, or you know, graphic convolution neural network emerge in recent years. So the underlying principle um, behind these um, learning-based encoding is actually quite straightforward. Um, instead of uh, searching in the original high dimensional and unorganized search space, the learning based encoding uses the architecture encoders to learn an architecture embedding in the low dimensional latent space. And uh, uh, conducting neural architecture search on such low dimensional latent space is actually much easier and is therefore more, uh, way more efficient than um, you know, the conducting the a search in the high dimensional unorganized search space. Well, if you take a, a closer look at it, uh, in these um, learning-based uh, encoding methods, architecture embeddings and search space are, are jointly optimized in a supervised manner, uh, which is uh, such supervised learning-based approach uh, is guided by the accuracies of the architecture searched by the search algorithm. However, um, such, search, uh, such joint supervised optimization cannot necessarily improve embedding learning. Uh, due to the entangling architecture representation and architecture search together. So as a consequence, so these methods are actually biased towards weight-free operations, for example, the identity or max pooling operators, um, which are often preferred early on in the search algorithm, in the search process, uh, which results in a, a lower final accuracies. So to this end, um, we propose a simple uh, yet um, effective uh, unsupervised architecture representation learning method um, uh, for neural architecture search. Uh, we name our method ARC2WAC. So the key distinction uh, between our approach and existing ones uh, is to decouple architecture re representation learning and architecture search into two separate processes. 
in particular, um, by learning architecture embeddings using only neural architectures without their accuracies, uh, Arc2WAC is able to construct the life-based uh, architecture embeddings, which benefit the downstream architecture search in terms of both efficiency and robustness. So here is a little bit of detail of, the, uh, of our method. So to achieve this, um, Arc2WAC utilizes a variational graph isomorphism autoencoder uh, to learn the embeddings of neural architectures in an unsupervised manner. Um, uh, formally speaking, um, uh, let A denote the adjacent matrix and X denote the operation matrix. So we first augment uh, the, uh, the adjacent matrix A um, as, the, uh, trans, uh, as to transfer original directed graph into a undirected one so that um, to, uh, to so as to allow a, a, a bidirectional information flow. So the encoder and the decoder are the are the same as the um, as the variational graph of the autoencoder, except that um, the inference model is parameterized by a you know, graph isomorphism network. So this is because we aim to learn an architecture embedding that is invariant uh, to the isomorphic graphs. Um, during training, uh, the model weights are learned by iteratively maximizing a variational lower bound. And this optimization objective is to uh, reconstruct the, new, the network architecture represented by the adjacency and operation matrices. So this is nothing different from this autoencoder in general. And, um, um, and uh, uh, moreover, we, um, we add uh, a KL term in the training uh, objective, uh, which is uh, used to regularize the mapping from the discrete space to the continuous latent space. Uh, this KL term um, helps to perform a better inference and to preserve the validity performance of the model, uh, as we all see in uh, in our evaluation section. So you know, once the um, the pre-trained embeddings are obtained, uh, they can be sent to the search algorithm in the downstream as the inputs for architecture search. Uh, so in this work, um, we use um, a, you know reinforcement learning and um, a basic optimization as two represent representative uh, search algorithms. Um, so for, for re reinforcement learning based search algorithm, uh, the pre-trained embeddings are passed to the policy LSTM for sampling. And we use the validation accuracy of the sample architecture as the reward. Um, for, the B, uh, for the base optimization based search, uh, the pre-trained embeddings are, are used to select the top K architectures in terms of the validation accuracy in each round of the search. So, um, so here is the, uh, the evaluation performance of our, of, of our uh, approach. So we first uh, examine um, the, the pre-trained performance of our approach on uh, three commonly used NASR spaces, uh, NAS Bench 101, NAS Bench 201, and the DART search space. So these three search spaces are kind of uh, standard uh, benchmarks used in uh, majority of the existing um, um, NAS papers. So in particular, um, we compare ArcWAC with um, with two popular baselines, uh, the graph autoencoders or GAE uh, in in short, and the variational graph autoencoders or uh, VGAE in short under three metrics. Uh, the reconstruction accuracy is the first metric, uh, which measures how accurate the re the reconstructed neural architecture uh, is. The second metric uh, is the validity. Um, which measures how often the generated architectures are valid. And lastly, uh, the uniqueness is the third metric, which measures how many generated valid architectures are unique. Um, uh, as shown in the table below, uh, Arc2WAC um, is able to achieve the highest reconstruction accuracy, validity, and uniqueness across all the three search spaces. Uh, due to its superior neighbor, uh, neighbor aggregation and the generative capability. So next, um, to understand why these um, pre-trained embeddings are superior over embeddings obtained from the supervised learning-based approach, um, we have conducted a, three, a series of experiments. So first, um, we compare the pre predictive performance of the pre-trained embeddings and the supervised uh, counterpart. So this experiment um, measures the, how well the embeddings 
can predict the performance of the corresponding architectures. To do this, um, we train a Gaussian process model with 250 sample, uh, sample data to predict all the data, and then report the results across 10 different seeds on that bench 101. Um, we use the metric RMSE and the, and, and the Pearson correlation coefficient to evaluate the points with test accuracy larger than 0 0.8. So the figure on the right um, shows the pre-training bedding uh, performance. As we can see here, um, the, uh, the pre-training bedding based on our approach uh, have a better predictive performance than the supervised counterparts. So second, um, we compare the distribution of the L2 distance between the architecture pairs by at a distance on NAS bench 101. Um, so we plot the relationship, uh, so you can see here, we plot the relationship between the L2 distance in the latent space and the added distance of the corresponding neural architectures for both the pre-trained and the supervised embeddings. As we can see uh, in the figure on the right, uh, the L2 distance of the, uh, the pre-trained embeddings grows monotonically uh, with, in with, the inc with increasing added distance. So this result indicates that um, the arc to WAC uh, approach can preserve the closest, uh, closestness between the two architecture measured by added distance. However, in contrast, such, close such closeness uh, is not well captured by the supervised uh, counterpart. So this observation um, indicates that uh, the pre-training embeddings are able to better capture the structural information of the neural of the neural networks and therefore make a similar architectures cluster better in the latent space. Um, so here is kind of uh, a visualization of the latent space learned um, by both the uh, by both of our MSR and its supervised learning counterpart in 2D space. Um, as, as we can see here, um, for arc to uh, which is the figure on the left, uh, the embeddings of the architectures span the whole latent space, and architectures with similar accuracies are clustered and distributed more smoothly in the latent space. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention here, the color represents um, uh, the different accuracies. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the, the, the red color representing the, the best performing architectures, while the, the darker, um, uh, the green and the bluish, a color represents the architectures that achieve less competitive accuracies. Um, so uh, as you can see on the left, the arc to wac uh, based uh, learning, uh, the latent space has uh, a smooth uh, latent space surface. So conducting uh, architectures on such smooth uh, latent uh, space uh, is actually much easier and, is, and it therefore it's more efficient. So in contrast, on, on, the, on the right, uh, for the supervised learning counterpart, the embeddings, as you can see here, are disjoint, disjointed and discontinuous. And, and the transition of this accuracy is actually non-smooth. So this actually indicates that the joint optimization guided by the accuracy of the architectures cannot injectively encode architecture structures. So as a consequence, architecture does not have uh, its unique embedding in the latent space, such that uh, it makes the, the task of architecture search um, more challenging. And lastly, um, this slide um, visualizes a sequence of architecture cells decoded from the latent, from the learned latent space of, of Arc2WAC and the supervised approach on NAS Bench 101. Um, the, the upper row, uh, shows the architectures um, of the arc to wac and the lower row uh, shows the architecture of the corresponding supervised learning-based approach. Um, as you can see here, um, for arc to wac um, the adjacent architectures change smoothly and embrace similar connections and operations. In contrast, um, the supervised counterpart on, uh, in, the, in the lower row um, does not group similar connections and operations well, and therefore has much higher added distance between these adjacent um, uh, architectures. So this realization um, 
demonstrates from the another perspective, uh, from another aspect uh, that um, um, you know the latent space um, learned um, is much smoother uh, uh, under ArcTOLAC. So now we are uh, we compare the architecture's performance of our approach. Um, you know, specifically, um, we uh, we reproduce the existing work, um, you know, uh, which are basically um, uh, uh, discrete encoding based methods uh, using uh, random search, uh, regularized evolution, and reinforced learning, and uh, something um, um, uh, based on optimization. So for supervised learning based approach and arc to whack, um, we use reinforcement learning and the based optimization as the two search algorithms. Um, the plot on the right um, shows the mean test regrets of 500 independent runs um, given a uh, 10 to the power of six seconds work clock time budget uh, on that bench 101. Uh, based on this figure, we have three key observations. So first of all, uh, as you can see here, um, you know, both um, uh, based on optimization and reference learning, um, uh, are, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the, the regularized evolution are the two best performing search methods uh, based on uh, discrete encoding. However, um, they perform slightly worse than the supervised embedding. And uh, if you compare our approach with the supervised embedding, arc to whack consider, consider, considerably um, outperforms its supervised counterpart and um, the discrete encoding, um, uh, particularly after, uh, um, you know, the, uh, if you look at the time, uh, uh, time stamp uh, after um, five times uh, time to the power of four a uh, clock seconds. So um, this, indicates that uh, given a dedicated uh, uh, time budget, our, our, our method uh, is able to um, uh, search a much better, uh, find a much better uh, architecture uh, given uh, a limited uh, uh, time uh, budget. Um, so this table shows the mean and standard deviation of the validation and test accuracy um, of the calculated, uh, calculated over 500 independent runs under three data sets uh, in, uh, in, not in, the, in the test bench and NAS bench 201. Um, as you can see, overall, you know, searching with r 2 consist consistently outperforms other approaches on all the three data sets, uh, you know, CIFR 10, CIFR 100, and ImageNet included in the NAS bench 201. Um, we also find that r 2 uh, leads to the better validation and test accuracy. Um, as well as reduce the variability. Um, so, um, you know, both adjacency matrix embedding and arc to whack actually um, belong to the category of structural aware encoding, um, where the goal um, is to learn an encoding that preserves the structural information of the neural architectures. However, um, as we illustrated in this slide, um, you know, two neural two neural networks, you know, one and two, uh, with different structures, um, can actually represent the same computation, um, right? So, for both architectures, uh, one and two, it's um, uh, they both represent the same computation, basically the sine x square plus this, um, plus sine x square. However, they have a different structural architecture. Well, this makes encoding computation actually a, a superior option um, than encoding structures. So this is because uh, you know if we encode uh, a computation, we could um, uh, map neural architectures with different structures but similar accuracy to the same region. So this contributes to an encoding space with respect to the actual performance of the neural architecture other than this indirect performance, which are, um, which is captured by the, uh, by the structure other than the, uh, other than the computation. Um, so, you know, as one of the, um, the computation aware encoding, uh, the path-based encoding is uh, created by giving a binary feature to each possible path from the input node to the output node of the neural network. Um, however, 
Um, although path-based encoding is able to map neural architectures uh, with neural, neural networks with different structures, but at the same computation to the same encoding, it scales exponentially because um, it has to uh, enumerate all the possible passes in the neural network to generate the encoding. So one remedy uh, of this is to use a truncation, but it leads to information loss. Moreover, the path-based encoding here shows worse generalization performance in outside search space compared to adjacency matrix-based encoding. So this is because it could not generalize to unseen passes that are not included in the training search space. Um, another computation where encoding uh, in the literature um, is the learning-based encoding named the DBAE. Um, the DBAE uses a shallow uh, GRU uh, to encode a computation, and its encoder is trained using the variation autoencoder in reconstruction loss uh, via a technique uh, uh, referred to as uh, asynchronous message passing. If you take a closer look at this method, however, uh, it, it's very challenging in practice because the directly learning the generative model based on a single architecture is actually not trivial. As a consequence, its pre-training is less effective and therefore a downside net performance not that competitive if you look at the, the, the paper. So to alleviate the limitation of existing computation aware encoding methods, um, we propose a new method, uh, which we refer to as Kate. As shown in the slide here, uh, Kate takes, um, um, uh, as a, at a high level, um, Kate uh, takes um, a paired computationally similar architecture as its input, um, similar to the language modeling uh, method of BERT, uh, you know, a well-known method. Kate trains a transformer-based model using the mask language model modeling objective. Uh, each input architecture pair is um, corrupted, corrupted uh, by replacing a fraction of their operations with a special mask token. The model is then trained to predict those masked operations from the corrupted architecture pair. So this is actually very similar um, to how the bird is trained using the uh, mask language modeling objective. However, um, Kate differs from BERT in two aspects, given the uniqueness of the neuroactive search problem uh, uh, domain. So first, um, in, the, in the context uh, of language modeling, each prediction has its inductive bias given the contextual information uh, from different positions. So this, however, is not the case in architecture encoding in, in, in the NAST problem domain. This is because the prediction distribution is uniform for any valid graph making it difficult to directly learn the generative model from a single architecture. So as example, uh, if we mask a con you know, convolution one by one operator and uh, do the prediction, um, you know, all the possible operations op operators have the same prediction probability as long as it forms a valid uh, graph. So this is actually very different from language modeling. So in other words, um, the, um, you know, there, there's no contextual bias in the prediction in the context of uh, architecture encoding learning. So this is actually um, the key difference between uh, architecture encoding learning and the language model, because in language, we always have the context information to help us to do the prediction. So therefore, um, to, uh, to address this, um, this, uh, this, uh, this issue, um, the Kate incorporates a pairwise uh, pre-trained scheme, um, which encodes computationally similar architecture pairs through two transformers with shared parameters. So these two individual encodings are then concatenated, and the concatenated encoding is fed into another transformer with a cross-attention encoder to encode the joint information of the architecture pair. A second technique involved in Kate <coughs> is that, <coughs> excuse me, um, this um, uh, fully visible attention mask used in BERT may not be used for architecture encoding learning. So this is because it does not reflect a single directional flow of the arch neural architectures. So therefore, um, instead of using a bidirectional transformer encoder as in BERT, Kate directly used the adjacency matrix to compute the, ca the, caus the causal mask. A pair of operations um, within an architecture 
are dependent um, if there is either an edge that directly connect them or a path made of a series of such edges that indirectly connect them together. Um, so the former one, uh, which we refer to the local dependency, and the later one uh, we refer to as uh, the long, long range uh, dependency. Uh, <clears throat> based on both uh, uh, local and long range dependency, um, the adjacency matrix is then uh, augmented with this um, uh, Floyd algorithm to encode the long range dependency of different operations. Um, so now let's take a look at the performance of, of, our, of our method. So uh, in our first um, experiment, uh, we compare Kate with um, a state-of-the-art um, um, 11 um, architecture encoding schemes under three major encoding independent uh, NAS subroutines on NAS Bench 101. So these encoding schemes inclu include um, so the one hot categorical and continuous adjacency matrix based encoding. Um, and also, you know, the, the DVAE, which is the, um, uh, you know, state of the art um, uh, baseline, and also ARC2WAC, which is our previous work. Um, <clears throat> for the three downstream, down, for the three major downstream NAS subroutines, uh, we include um, uh, some uh, random architecture subroutine. Uh, we also include um, uh, regularization evolution uh, and also. Uh, some of the state-of-the-art neural predictor-based uh, subroutines, um, which are, um, you know, which are uh, more uh, more widely used uh, given its um, uh, less um, uh, um, very efficient uh, search uh, uh, cost. Um, so this figure um, shows uh, the, the overall results. Um, it's a little bit um, uh, hard to see, but uh, let me help. Uh, um, <coughs> Uh, go through the th go through the results. So as you can see here, for every single um, for every single subroutine, uh, we show the top five best performing encoding schemes. Um, overall, uh, despite there's a over despite there's no overall best encoding, we found that um, uh, the Kate is among always among the top five uh, encodings across all the subroutines. Um, specifically, uh, if you look at um, uh, the random architecture uh, subroutine, we found that uh, if we use a random search, um, um, the adjacency matrix encoding performs the best. Um, the random search uh, using continuous encoding performs slightly worse. Um, um, I think uh, due to the uh, due to the discretization loss um, per uh, reason. So <clears throat> for for the per tube architecture subroutine, um, you know, Kate. Uh, which is our method, outperforms uh, the adjacency matrix based encoding and a pass based encoding, which is the state of the art. Um, this is because uh, the NAS Bench 101 uh, benchmark already shows the locality in, in, the, uh, in, in the added distance, and the encoding computation makes architecture even closer in terms of the accuracy and allows the evolution or local search to find architectures with similar performance in local neighborhood more easily. Um, so in our second experiment, um, we compare the, um, the neural architecture search performance that based on Kate encoding with other state-of-the-art NAS methods uh, on NAS 101 uh, and, uh, and, and NAS, uh, uh, NAS Bench 301. So NAS Bench 301 um, is a, a new surrogate benchmark on the DART, uh, on, on the DART's uh, search, mess, uh, search space. Um, which is much larger than actually uh, much larger than the NAS Bench 101 benchmark. Um, so as you can see here um, on NAS Bench 101, uh, 301, um, you know, Kate um, <clears throat> not only converge faster, uh, but also lead to better final search performance uh, given the same uh, time budget. Um, finally, um, we evaluate uh, the generalization uh, capability of, of Kate beyond the search space on which it was trained. Um, so this is actually a very important experiment. And uh, you know, this is really because uh, in real world practice, um, uh, you know, um, the most common um, uh, practice is really, you can't really uh, see the, all, the, all, all the search space. 
So you always um, uh, train uh, the mo uh, model from part of the search space and uh, conduct search in the remaining search space. So this experiment really uh, emulates um, the real world um, neuroactive search uh, scenario. Um, so more specifically, the training, you know, the training search space is designed as a subset of the NAS Bench 101, um, where each includes architectures has two to six nodes um, and one to seven edges. The test of search space uh, is disjointed from the search training space and includes architectures with the, all the remaining um, uh, neural architecture candidates. Uh, we compared our method uh, with the adjacency matrix based encoding because it was shown to have the best generalization capability compared to other encoding methods. Um, a simple two layer MLP with a hidden size 128 is used as a neural predictor for both encodings. Uh, as you can see from the, uh, from the figure, um, our master Kate outperforms the adjacency matrix based encoding by a large margin. So this result um, indicates that um, uh, Kate can better contextualize the computation information, uh, which as a consequence generates better when adapting to outside search space. So this is actually um, um, a really a breakthrough uh, in your search because um, we have um, uh, fundamentally demonstrated um, the, the generalization capability of our method in this um, outside search space, which is, again, um, <clears throat> emulates the real world uh, uh, neuroactive search scenarios. Okay, so, um, um, you know, uh, for every single um, uh, applications, um, um, you know, one, um, we, we wanted to not only um, build a, a one component, but actually uh, build a complete machine learning system pipeline, um, starting from the domain data set um, to, uh, to the target, uh, to the tar target device. The, the neural net search or NAS technique I presented uh, earlier um, is um, for automating the AI model design components of this uh, whole machine learning uh, system pipeline. Um, another key component of the machine learning system uh, is this component of data engineering. So in the second part, I wanted to uh, briefly talk about of, of a recent work uh, on you know, uh, our, our data-centric autonomous machine learning, which basically um, was the goal uh, to, 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 um, to, automatic, uh, to automatically uh, design the uh, data engineering techniques, uh, which uh, uh, as already see, uh, as already shown to, uh, which is another key component of this um, uh, machine learning system pipeline. So in particular, um, uh, we we particular um, focus on um, uh, data augmentation, which is actually one of the most important and widely used uh, data engineering techniques, um, you know, in, in uh, when designing um, uh, uh, machine learning systems. Uh, as a brief um, uh, uh, background uh, uh, overview, um, you know, data augmentation uh, um, has been has been shown um, to um, um, to improve the perform uh, performance of the trained model um, because it effectively recognizes the model by increasing the data diversity. Um, so, in recent years, um, there is um, there is significant interest of uh, automating the you know, the data augmentation techniques. So um, the task of this automated uh, data, data augmentation is to uh, develop a techniques uh, to automatically determine a good um, a data augmentation policy. And uh, based on this uh, policy, we can then um, sample a set of transformation from the obtained policy and then apply them to data samples uh, during training. So if you look at the literature, however, um, there are some key limitations in this existing automated machine learning, uh, uh, automated data augmentation methods. Uh, first, uh, all these existing um, uh, methods uh, require a set of uh, hand-picked uh, default um, uh, transformation, uh, such as uh, you know, the flip or cutout or crop operations. Uh, the second limitation lies that um, uh, they all need 
to manually uh, determine the augmentation depths or in, uh, or in other words, the number of augmentation layers involved in the augmentation uh, data augmentation pipeline. So to address the limitation of the existing methods, um, uh, we propose um, a new method uh, called the deep auto augment, where the goal, um, our goal is to <clears throat> develop a method that can fully automate the data augmentation policy search. So in other words, um, uh, our goal is to um, develop a, a fully automated technique that no longer needs to pick the set of default transformation, uh, as well as the um, manually determine the augmentation depths. In other words, um, we our method can automatically um, so identify the augmentation uh, depths, um, you know, which is um, which is um, the existing work cannot cannot achieve. So to achieve this, um, we need to address two key uh, two key challenges. The first challenge lies that uh, what training signal we should use to guide the training of the uh, of the policy. Uh, the second challenge is that um, uh, how we uh, address the exponential growth of the search space, given that um, uh, when we increase the depths of our augmentation uh, policy layers. So to address the first challenge. Um, we use um, gradient matching as the training signal. So the intuition behind our design is that uh, uh, if the distribution of the augmented data gets closer to the full data set, the direction of the gradient of the augmented data should match the gradient of the validation batch sampled from the true data, data distribution. So therefore, um, we aim to optimize the cosine similarity between them which is, um, uh, which is referred to um, as a gradient matching in the literature. So more, specific, uh, more, specific, <clears throat> more specifically, um, formally speaking, um, we use the X um, to denote a training data point. Um, we use um, a TN to denote the augmentation of transformation um, from the candidate set. And we use um, uh, you know, G, uh, T, and X to, to denote uh, the gradient uh, of the sample X augmented by transformation uh, TN. So for each transformation, we assign a probability um, uh, P uh, theta N, which serve as the augmentation policy that we are, um, we, are we, you, we, 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 we focus uh, to, to optimize. Um, by averaging the, the per sample gradients according to the policy, we can obtain the training gradient, which is also a function of the policy parameter. Um, <clears throat> we also calculated the gradient of the validation batch sampled from the true data distribution. The final objective then is um, to maximize the cosine similarity between the gradient of the, uh, uh, of the augmented batch and the gradient of the validation batch. Uh, which is which is um, conducted uh, through gradient uh, ascent. Um, finally, we also incorporate uh, a, um, um, a a regularization trick where we penalize the transformation with high variance. So the overall effect of this regularization is to decrease the probability of the transformation with higher variance, and uh, at the same time increasing the probability of the Transformation with lower variance across the set. So we name our uh, we name this as the regularized gradient matching, um, <clears throat> which basically different uh, from the the standard gradient matching method. Um, so um, um, as I mentioned before, um, as we use um, or as we add uh, more uh, more layers of transformation. Um, the second challenge is that the number of combination um, of the operations uh, involved uh, uh, across all these uh, transformation layers uh, grows exponentially with the um, number of layer or the depths K. So to address this um, uh, exponential growth issue, um, um, we, um, uh, we, we, uh, we, we, um, the, we used a, a, a technique where the augmentation policy at the case layer 
is optimized based on the distribution augmented by the previous k minus one augmentation layer. So in other words, uh, we we progressively um, um, optimize the um, uh, optimize the policy over uh, across layers, other than um, um, optimize them all together. So in this manner, the policy um, PK implicitly uh, depends on the policy of all the previous uh, K minus one layers. What the dimension of the, each policy is still uh, still remains a constant as n. So by using this trick, we significantly reduce the, the search uh, cost uh, uh, of um, uh, even though we increase the depth of our um, search policy. So uh, let's take a look at the performance of our of our method. Uh, we have evaluated our method um, on standard benchmarks on CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, and ImageNet. As you can see here, um, um, we we observed that uh, our our method um, Deep AA outperforms all the previous um, automated uh, data augmentation methods on you know both the um, both of the search spaces. Um, in particular, um, we um, we we are we are able to uh, uh, achieve much better performance than one of the pioneer work, uh, which is the automatic augment method, which is uh, um, you know referred to as AA, and we also um, achieve a better performance uh, of the state of, of the art, uh, uh, which is uh, called a TA. Um, so. Uh, which demonstrate the superiority of our method. Um, so to understand, uh, to help understand uh, why our method uh, has achieved a superior performance, um, we have conducted uh, uh, a series of um, experiments. Uh, firstly, we conduct a search of a single layer augmentation and apply it um, with the default transformation. Um, with this, which are the which which are which are the same as the previous works, so we refer um, uh, to the we refer this uh, variant um, uh, as uh, deep AB simple. Uh, as you can see on the right, uh, we observe that uh, you know even with a single searched augmentation layer, uh, deep AB simple is still outperforms all the other methods. Um, another second a second interesting observation is that. Um, 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 you know, if you compare with the uh, with the full size of deep A, which consists of six layers, um, the deep A shows a significant performance gain over this a single layer uh, deep A simple baseline. Um, so, secondly, we wanted to uh, uh, demonstrate uh, the validity um, of of a method on why we wanted to optimize uh, with uh, the regularized version of the gradient matching. So we have uh, to do so, to do so. We have um, a conducted experiment to, to compare with a a, a simple baseline, um, where uh, which is referred to as the deep TA, um, where the deep TA is nothing but um, uh, a baseline where we stack multiple layers of uh, of a TA, which is basically the state of the art. Um, so as we can see, um, deep AA, uh, which is our method. Um, exhibits uh, not only the higher cosine similarity, um, a lower a lower performance, but actually, but also um, higher accuracy compared to this state of the art uh, baseline. And finally, um, we um, we real, we realized the distribution of the transformation uh, our method uh, uh, learned over all the six layers. Um, as we can see here, um, for um, um, as you can see here, the, our method um, shows that uh, our, our method itself can uh, automatically uh, determine the number of augmentation layers. Uh, this is because uh, you know uh, our method converges to, to the identity uh, transformation, and uh, as indicated uh, by the by the red box, um, where basically indicates that uh, you know um, there there's there's no more augmentation needed. Uh, to further enhance the performance, uh, as it, by doing this, um, we can we can use the identity um, operation as a indicator to demonstrate uh, uh, to 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 indicate where uh, we have um, 
determine the optimum number of layers uh, of uh, of the of the uh, in, uh, data augmentation pipeline. Um, in this particular case, uh, the number is is six. Okay, so um, um, so for more information and uh, and our uh, uh, for for more information, uh, please uh, look at uh, our our papers and we also open sourced our of work. Um, uh, feel free to, um, uh, to 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 use them and so that uh, they can benefit uh, uh, to to your own research. Um, so with that, uh, um, I want to thank you for for all for your um, uh, attention. And, um, um, and this concludes my talk and uh, I welcome any questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor John. So very informative talk. And um, any questions from the audience? Uh, Professor, I have a question. Uh, Sure. <laughs> um, um, in your uh, previous slides, there is a structure like transform, like a transform structure. Uh, mm -hmm. You input two parallel transform before the overall structure. Right. Uh -huh. um, that is a pre use as a tokenizer or you train both of them together? Um. We, we train both of them together. So basically, I think the key idea, if I understand your question correctly, so um, uh, I, I, as I mentioned that, um, um, you know, architecture learning is a little bit different from uh, language modeling, where in language modeling, we have, um, you know, uh, each every single word, you can you can treat that as, as, a, as a token. Uh, mm -hmm. And then um, you can have all those contextual information because um, the word next to each other has a contextual meaning, right? You know, mm -hmm. the word on the left may depend on the word on the right, uh, because mm -hmm. it is it is it provides a contextual language, uh, you know, meaning. However, mm -hmm. this is very different um, in in you know uh, neural architectures because if you think about it, if you if you mask out any operator uh, mm -hmm. or you know in in the neural architecture and replace that with another one. Uh, mm -hmm. It does not really, um, you know, give you a invalid context, con uh, contextual architecture, right? It still, uh, mm -hmm. it, it still uh, gives you a valid architecture, right? Mm -hmm. So, in other words, you you cannot um, you cannot um, leverage the contextual information uh, like we we have uh, like the one we have in language modeling. Right. Mm -hmm. So to address this, uh, we, we, we really have to use um, uh, two architectures, right? Mm -hmm. So they can compare to each other to give uh -huh. a context to each other. So we actually uh -huh. create this context by providing a pair of architectures, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, the, you know, so um, and um, um, we, we have a, a key assumption here is that uh, uh, the two architectures or two neural network uh, uh, they are actually more similar if they have uh, more similar computation. And how you measure that is you can you can use their accuracies as a uh -huh. indirect measurement of how similar their computations are, right? So this uh -huh. is why we we use a, a pair of architectures um, so uh, to um, to to kind of provide uh, contextual information to each other. Uh, okay. That's uh, why. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. The structure looks a little bit like a uh, soft actor critic critics. It's like a reinforcement structure. They also have like two parallel training structures like this one. I, I'm not sure if it is similar, but it just remind me of that structure. It's like right. We we have we so we 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 include the two architectures and we we uh, we tokenize every single one. And we have a cross um, uh, architecture layer that um, learned the similarity across both architectures. So, so before you uh, feed the data inside of uh, into those two transformers, you still have a tokenizer before that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, okay. Uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Professor. Yeah. No problem. So you know you, you can you can refer to our codes. I think it's it's a uh, um, it's well documented. It's well commented. 
Um, mm -hmm. you, can, you, can, you can refer to, the, to our code base um, mm -hmm. if you, uh, if you uh, want to know more details. And obviously, you can, uh, you can always send us emails. Um, Thanks. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you, Professor. Other questions from the audience? Yeah, I, I also have a quick question. Um, so Professor John, uh, I think the gradient matching operator is a, like a great insight. Uh, but I have a quick question is that I think uh, for evaluating, uh, for estimating the gradient, uh, it has to be like uh, estimated with respect to a certain like model with certain architectures. Right, right. So yeah, how do you pick the like the model? Like, do, do you need to necessarily evaluate on a set of different models with different architectures, or just one is sufficient? Um, well, we you know um, we we select our our architectures um, based on what are existing work selected. So for for fair comparison. So um, uh, if I recall correctly, in our paper we selected two architectures. Uh, to show the generality, to show the generality across the architectures, and you can refer to the paper uh, for our specific experiments. Um, but um, you know, um, the whole purpose is to compare with the existing work uh, in a fair manner. So we did not really uh, intention to uh, um, to select a different architecture, right? So, but uh, but back to your question, we it is really depends on the architecture we we selected, but uh, we selected because. Uh, you know, for fair comparison purpose. Uh, yeah, so uh, from my understanding, like the insight behind that is uh, like you, you want to find two different argument, uh, argumentation, like strategies that produce the similar gradients. So um, I, I, I just wonder like uh, if you are only like evaluating that gradient on a uh, given specific uh, architecture, um, like if the architecture changes, um, like can you still guarantee that the uh, chosen augmentation strategy can still produce the similar gradient? Uh, so um, I I believe so, but um, but I I agree with you. It also it may also have some variations because of the difference be across the architectures. Um, yeah. Um, but in our experiments, we we showed that it generates well to other architectures. Uh, you can you can refer to the paper, um, for for more details. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions. If no question from the audience, as I actually I have several questions. Sure. First, so for your uh, work on the computational wellness, so I was wondering, so uh, how can this approach to be integrated when we consider about the actual speed up on the hardware performance? Because we know that the computational cost doesn't necessarily translate to the, the measurable speed up. Right. Right. So, um, well, you you. Um, uh, so you can you can use um, uh, potentially any um, metric as the guidance for the train for the training of the embeddings, right? So um, um, you know, in 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 our work, we use the um, the structural information. Uh, as the as the guidance, we use the computational information as the guidance, and obviously you can also use the 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 real performance on the real hardware uh, as the guidance for the training of the embeddings. Um, you know, but uh, my my uh, I can imagine that that this may have uh, a lot of uh, overheads because uh, you know you really have to measure the architecture on the real hardware. Um, to get a sample, right, for 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 that training set, uh, and obviously, uh, I, I you can you can, for example, use uh, probably a, a surrogate model to approximate that, so that you can reduce the overhead of uh, you know really measuring the performance on the real hardware. And you know there are many things you can do. Um, but uh, back to your question, you know you, you can literally select any kind of metric that you think is meaningful. Um, 
for, to guide the training of the embeddings. Okay. And uh, another question that so for uh, so for your first and the second work, I think that you, you want to propose some new fundamental uh, subrouting for the NAS, right? Right, right. Um, exactly. And exactly. in that case, so how about the, the overall performance when you applied your key component to the entire NAS framework and how about the, the performance under the, the, like the GPU hours and so on? Because in your slide, it only shows that the number of the samples you need to search. Um, so um, I, I think, I, I think let, me, let me clarify a little bit. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think the, the fundamental contribution uh, is compared to the existing literature is really, as you mentioned, is so we actually add a new component uh, into the existing uh, NAS pipeline where we demonstrate that the benefit of this new component can benefit the overall uh, NAS pipeline. Um, so um, I, I think if you recall that, so we, we actually demonstrate uh, the end-to-end the -end performance uh, of uh, having our a new component into the into the pipeline, uh, where we show that we can use um, the least amount of uh, searches um, to identify a better uh, uh, a better performing uh, neural architecture, right? So um, that that's uh, in my opinion is is a very strong uh, result uh, to demonstrate the efficiency of our method in in terms of neural architecture search. Okay, great. thank you. And, and another question is that, so for sure. your uh, automatic uh, augmentation, I think that's a very interesting work. And uh, uh, I'm curious about that. So uh, based on your understanding, like, so what, because you select uh, the, uh, the different type of the, the uh, augmentation techniques from a pool, right? Right, right. And so is there, is there any like the, the the preference of the, the which type of the, the augmentation method is kind of the more suitable or more powerful to improve the accuracy. And another sub question is that, so, um, so because there's no free launch, right? So we can have like 2% this is a very amazing uh, increase. So accuracy increase. So then, so what is the penalty like? So how many more data augmentations we need to use here, like, because definitely we have increased the training time, right? Or, and uh, is there any like time kind of, how about the scalability for this? So, so like if we want to use more data augmentations, whether the, there's a kind of war there to hidden, hidden uh, the further performance improvement. Yeah. Great question. So um, I, I think I'll, I'll answer your question from, from a few um, aspects. I think the first one, uh, the first aspect is I wanted to mention is, um, 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 so um, in this particular work, we focus on the task of image classification, um, which is also one, one task that is probably one of the most explored uh, tasks. Uh, and also uh, we have seen a lot of um, benefits of using data documentation to improve the performance of image classification. So um, if you look at the literature, um, people um, you know, in this area, um, they have a lot of domain knowledge about uh, data, uh, how to augment the data for the task of image classification. So this is why if you take a closer look at their method, they always include um, a, a number of augmentation, which we called, uh, which we refer to as default augmentation in, in this work. Uh, in, in, also in my presentation. So these default augmentation are actually uh, basically uh, people think are the best or the most useful augmentations that you have to include in your data, data, data augmentation pipeline before you, know, before you start a training, right? So they think these, if I recall correctly, yeah, there are three of them. Uh, they, no matter what other augmentation they do, uh, or they always, uh, you know, uh, use these three augmentations uh, as as uh, as a, a significant part of their total um, augmentation portfolio. Um, so, um, and then for the other uh, 
types of augmentation people normally uh, you know design a, um, um, a heuristically design a search space that include others and they do not really know how to select them this is this just do a random selection right so so as you can see here um they they, they um for for this for the state of the art they 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 have a lot of domain knowledge which basically are, are reflected by the three default transformation or augmentation uh, operations uh, combined with other uh, operations which are sampled you know in a, in a mostly in a, in a random in a random manner um, so our work um, shows that um, um, we can get rid of those um, uh, uh, default um, uh, augmentation and more 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 importantly this tells us we can actually, Get rid of all the domain uh, knowledge, um, you know, uh, uh, injected by human beings, right? Um, so this this aspect is really can be really a power can be really powerful to be applying to other tasks that are not well studied, right? In this in this you know for for image classification, there are a lot of experiences and a lot of um, uh, domain knowledge accumulated over the years. But how how about the other? Uh, tasks. How about the other um, data 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 type, right? In like uh, medical images, uh, like all many like uh, you know, satellite images, which are very different from natural images, like you know included in in um, you know in ImageNet in CIFAR 10, right? So this, um, in my opinion, is uh, a significant represent a significant potential of our approach uh, for uh, automating uh, or getting rid of all the domain knowledge. Um, for new tasks or in or in a new data set domains. So I, I think this is one of the, um, I, th I think the key contributions um, uh, of our approach that can benefit not only for uh, the image classification tasks, but also for many other tasks. Yeah, um, right. And I think for, for, for the second part of your question, uh, you referred to as uh, the, there's no free lunch, right? Um, um, basically, uh, you you do need to incorporate uh, um, uh, a lot of time in in terms of designing those data training uh, data augmentation policy. Um, uh, this this is true, but um, you know my my argument is that uh, uh, this is a just a, a one time effort. Um, so um, uh, um, you know uh, you, you just you just train just uh, train once. And then apply this, uh, you know, data augmentation policy, train the data policy to augment the data. So uh, if you, uh, I think I did not really uh, put uh, the the training cost in in this presentation slide, but uh, you can find that in the in in the paper uh, where we compared our uh, the training cost uh, of our approach uh, against um, all the state of the art approaches. Uh, you, you will see that um, uh, our training cost is it's uh, much less. Uh, given that uh, our our second technique, where we uh, we propose to use this uh, progressive uh, 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 training trick, um, you know, um, instead of uh, you know exhaustively searching the the whole uh, search space, yeah. So uh, we we actually um, you know, the balance is pretty well, and we have a very strong um, uh, accuracy uh, performance, and also a very strong um, uh, search cost, uh, much less search cost. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, any other questions from the audience? Um, hi, Professor. <laughs> I sure. Was, I'm thinking of uh, your your speech, like um, you augment the data uh, to a broader domain. Uh, for example, like uh, can we just uh, randomly like uh, uh, take some like daily activities image and uh, Observe their data distributions and augment our data with like ImageNet before we train our own model. Is that my understanding is right for your approach? Um, well, I mean, um, your training data set is always limited, right? That's this is why you wanted to apply data augmentation in the first place um, to. Um, to increase the diversity uh, of your training data set, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Such that um, 
you know, your augmented data set can be more similar to the validation data sets so that you can get a better performance after training, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, um, that, that's, that's, that's what you always wanted to do, right? And, um, but now, you know, I, I think the question is how you, 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 how you do this, right? Uh, I, I think you mentioned about, you know, doing some randomness. This is actually, um, actually yeah, uh, go ahead. like in, uh, data set like image that they are purposefully uh, captured uh, with some training purpose. But in our daily life, some of the image have some noise or specific, the word meanings may be different from ImageNet. So their data distributions like the light or the colors may be a little bit different in different right. locations. So right. maybe right. we, I just don't understand your, your mean, what you mean. Like uh, I can capture some of the other scenarios and to absorb their data distribution and the pre-train uh, ImageNet based uh, model uh, and to augment the ImageNet. Uh, with that data distribution. Is that what you mean? Um, well, you know, my, 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 you know, my understanding to, to what you said is uh, you, you have a pre-trained model, you pre-trained using ImageNet. I want right? to train a model with the ImageNet, but my final purpose is that uh, real life data. So maybe I cannot take all of them, but before I, before I take all of them, um, I want to pre-train a model. Yeah, yeah, like you said. And um, I only have ImageNet now. So can I like just modify the ImageNet data distribution based on my uh, my own data distribution? Is that your method? Uh, sort of. Uh... If I understand correctly, uh, kind of, yeah. Well, you you have uh, basically you have this, you know the, the distributions are different, right? You wanted mm -hmm. to align this distribution, you know, uh, more so that they, they are more similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In general, yeah, of course, yeah. That's 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 all the documentation you know technique want to do. Oh yes, thank you. I understand what you mean. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for your question. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so let's thank uh, Professor John again for giving us this very wonderful, very informative talk. And also I thank everyone to attend our this sem this, uh, today's seminar and uh, see you next Tuesday. And uh, thank you to me. Thank very you. Much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Oh, Bye. Thank you. you too. Bye.